it's it's an idea, uh, the test of time. You know, I just think it's an important idea for those of us who love film, who want to preserve film, because we're all connected to the pictures that really last and hold up. Hello, and welcome back to The Director's Cut, brought to you by the Directors Guild of America. This episode, we're bringing you a special conversation between directors George Stevens Jr. and Paul Thomas Anderson. Following the release of his memoir, My Place in the Sun, Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington, Stevens reflects on his relationship with his father, acclaimed director and two-term DGA president George Stevens, and his unique vantage point to Guild history. A DGA member since 1951, Stevens Jr. is a founding director of the American Film Institute, a co-creator of the Kennedy Center Honors, and has directed numerous television episodes, movies for television, and documentaries. Listen on for his exclusive conversation with Paul Thomas Anderson, DGA Award-nominated director of Licorice Pizza and There Will Be Blood. The two talk about their shared Valley upbringing, Stevens' own path through the spotlight, and what the legacy of his family in Hollywood and the Guild means to him. Hello, my name is Paul Thomas Anderson. I'm here to interview George Stevens Jr. about his book, My Place in the Sun, uh, Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington. And I am George Stevens Jr. uh, And I'm here to answer whatever tough questions Paul Thomas Anderson is going to ask me, and I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how much time we have, but George, I mean, the hard part here is I don't know how you've consolidated such an incredible life into, you know, what what I guess by standards is a long book, but still it feels like you've done an incredible job of getting it all in there. Um, but still, we could talk for three days and we wouldn't even scratch the surface. Uh, well, you have final cut. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm here. I'll follow you wherever you take me. Well, we, we just started talking about Ventura Boulevard. I mean, it's as good a place to start as any, because that's really the beginning for you, isn't it, in Toluca Lake? Um, yeah. yeah. That house is still there that you grew up in, isn't it? It is. Yes. It's the one with a very, it's, it's got a very tall yeah, frame. So it, to it. Yeah, it, that small house, but uh, on the right. corner of Foreman and Navajo. Foreman and Navajo. That's right. Amazing. So you've done your location scouting. So we're. Well, it's, um, you know, there's so many wonderful passages in the book where you just sort of so effortlessly, effortlessly throw away jumping into the car with your father and heading down Ventura Boulevard to Joel McCrea's ranch, you know, and these are the sorts of things that get me just buzzing the descriptions of this Ventura. So Ventura Boulevard, which we share in common. Yeah. Talk about that. Was that, that's your, it's a kind of vein, isn't it? No, but it's interesting because, uh, you know, for our audience and members of the Guild, the context is important is that, I grew up in North Hollywood, uh, kind of 40 years before you did. Yeah. And Ventura Boulevard is <laughs> still there. And I, I went to school on Ventura Boulevard. And I, as, as you mentioned in the, the story, just before my father went to war, I, I was 11. And we got in his Lincoln Continental Cabriolet. and drove out Ventura Boulevard to Joel McRae's ranch, mm-hmm. um, where we were met by Joel and his son, Jody, who was my age, and they had their Western, out, we, we had our Western outfits on, and we spent the day <clears throat> riding um, on Joel's ranch. And, and, and what I loved about Joel McRae is one of the most endearing and modest actors yeah, uh, one would ever meet. Yeah, and Joel even referred to his profession as rancher and his hobby as actor. <laughs> That's right. Um, there's a lovely um, mention about Joel as it relates to your father, and that doesn't he say something to the extent of, "Well, I know he could have." Yeah, 
tell, tell me that he's I know I can, he could have Cary Grant for the, he could have anybody for this but he want he, but that speaks to your father's eye and understanding of casting that even when he could get the bigger star he knew the right person for the part and, and, and as Joe and as Joel telling the story he, he was known to say that he never saw a script that didn't have Gary Cooper's fingerprints. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, which is, which is a modesty, very becoming. But 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 then he got, he kind of was serious, and he said, well, "You know, George George knew what he wanted." He said, "If he could have had somebody better, like Gable or Jimmy Stewart, he'd say no. For this, I want McRae." <laughs> but again, I just taken by the modesty of Joel that he would state that. <laughs> sure, of course. Oh, he's such a terrific actor. Such a terrific actor. There's another thing that we're talking about, Joel, that I've always loved. Dad sometimes, you know, had a, a strain with, with, with sound men. They were men in those days. And before we started shooting, he said to Joel, he said, Joel, if the sound man doesn't complain that he's having trouble hearing you, you're acting too much. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. You know, and you just look at Joel in The More the Merrier, which is the picture we're talking about. And just that, you know, he's just kind of mumbling his lines. You can, you can understand them all, but it's just, there's just no acting going on. Absolutely, I love that as a as a kind of technique, which I must say I used along the way. Oh, can I steal that too? I've got to steal that as well. That's yeah. great. <laughs> it's so hard to know where to begin, but um, you know these kinds of wonderful passages in the book. It's it's funny actually. There's a passage in the book just starting out in your in your early days studying under your father. I have noticed in your father's films that he is the all-time master of, of many things, but in particular, the dinner table scenes. He just somehow, uh, no one can do dinner table scenes like uh, George Stevens. You know, it was like, um, yeah. did, has time just proven that? Or was he aware that the dinner table is a great place to do a scene and to do them right? Can you talk a little bit about what you saw in that? Because it's amazing to me, the precision that seems to be there, but then in hearing some recountings that he would, not that there wasn't precision involved, but he would shoot a lot and a lot from a lot from a different angles, you know? Um, and I'm referring of course to, you know, the, the, to Alice Adams, uh, giant place in the sun's got a view. I mean, um, can you speak to that at all? And because I guess the question is, what was dinner table like at your house? <laughs> well, well, we were a small family. I was an only child, so mm -hmm. that may not have been the model, but, but I, I remember we recently showed the restored 4K version of Giant. Yes. And there's that scene in Virginia at the very beginning of the picture when Rock Hudson goes to buy a horse in Virginia and the the doctor who owns a horse, his daughter is Elizabeth Taylor character, mm -hmm. uh, Leslie Benedict. And, and it has that dinner table scene. And I remember Steven Spielberg said to me about it. He said, it looks like the camera is where the script clerk should be. Right. Right. <laughs> but, right. but he did. He shot, uh, he shot lots of film. And that film is so precisely, it doesn't feel edited but it just every moment is just so razor sharp in introducing the, the, the four or five characters at the table and you uh, immediately know who they are for the rest of the picture, uh, particularly uh, the Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor characters. So yeah, the dinner table was something he was comfortable with. I suppose it's, ra it's, kind, it's, um, it's, it's rather brilliant to start an epic story that talks about the whole history of the world, race, oil, the West, you know, all this sort of stuff, but you really start it with a dinner table scene because, it, and this love story that really at the center of it is the thing. Um, I know you, you talk in the book about that being one of the first things that you felt the most involved in that sort of the writer's room, which I suppose was the writer's room is your living room, right on Foreman Avenue. 
you know, by that time we were on Riverside Drive. Oh, you're on Riverside Drive. My okay. mother had built those apartment houses. At by the time that writer's room happens in the formulation of, let's say, Giant, mm -hmm. I, I've never read the book of Giant, so I wouldn't know what they were, what, what you all were dealing with trying to whittle down into something that was a manageable size, even though it ended up being so, so dense and so long. Yeah, it, it, it's a, a very well-organized, well-told story that I, I must be four or 500 page, pages. Um, and it was just, you know, finding a structure and making it work. But it was, you know, I spent eight months with, with, with the writers. Uh, my father, Fred Gill, a colleague of his from the Hal Roach days, uh, yeah. the director. And uh, Ivan Moffat, screenwriter, and uh, you know, for me, it was a great experience. <clears throat> so it, it was it was after that that you started to, that you went off to. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let's back up because I want to talk about <clears throat> as it relates to the DGA, especially. Is the is you know did, what your memories are of that this kind of fantastic passage in the book, the kind of ringside seat to. There's a pic, even a picture, a photograph of the DeMille, the kind of coup d'etat that DeMille is <laughs> attempting. I tell you, I had heard a little bit of that story, but it now makes perfect sense the way that you've written it out in the book it seems to be the clearest, my clearest understanding of it. And then you had a, then you had a ringside seat there then for that. Well, I did. I mean, it was just by coincidence that I was home from Occidental College. I was... Uh... I must have been a freshman, and on Saturday, and and Dad said, "What are you doing? You want to? I've got to go down, you know, to Hollywood." <clears throat> and so we got in the car and drove down uh, to the Directors Guild, which was then at a place called Crossroads of the World, which is still there near the Hollywood Athletic Club. And Dad got out of the car and walked and kind of rang the bell, and nobody answered. The guild's supposed to be open on Saturday. And then he went, kind of looked in a couple of windows and came back. And he told me that he'd received a 600 word telegram from DeMille and Frank Capra and several other directors calling for Joseph L. Mankiewicz, the president of the Guild, to be recalled and justifying this action. And so in the sense I was, you know, there at the, at the kickoff <laughs> uh -huh. and then I, you know, I heard about it, and then obviously, when I wrote this book, I became more deeply interested in it. I'd written about, I'd made it part of the film I made about my father, George Stevens, a filmmaker's journey, mm -hmm. and I interviewed Joe Mankiewicz and John Huston and Fred Zinnemann and Ruben Mamoulian, uh, mm -hmm. great members of the Guild, mm -hmm. uh, and Capra uh, about that. And so, but for the book, I really dug into it and I found dad's notes that are <clears throat> in the Stevens collection at the Motion Picture Academy. Mm -hmm. His notes from interviewing the secretaries to find out what DeMille and the others were doing with them in terms of manipulating this voting. He seemed to have a very steady a hand in 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 th guiding everyone through this. He seemed in in a pinch the most stable of all these movie directors who would actually get to the bottom of the the facts. While the rest of them seemed to be slightly more reckless. Um, yeah, or yeah, or, yeah. Um, he was a, a very. My, my mother said, you, you know, she never saw anybody win an argument with George. He, he should have been a lawyer. <laughs> Well, it's a terrific passage, you know, uh, especially that, yeah, that tidbit, that's something that I didn't know, the DGA being at the crossroads of the world, which is terrific. But that's actually interesting. You mentioned something about going to your dad's archives. In the writing process on this book, um, I guess, what's my question? How how good was your, I'm, I'm taking this stuff further back, not even just about your dad, but when it comes to all the kind of early stuff with your grandmother and the performances up in the Bay Area, was that stuff that your family had done a good job of taking care of those stories and, and, and passing them on? Or did you need help 
trying to tie some loose ends together when it came that far back to sort of early theater days and vaudeville days, that kind of stuff. Well, I guess that, that leads to a point kind of about the Stevens family. My father kept everything, mm -hmm. you know, and it, Lord knows why, but he had a, bringing us back to Ventura Boulevard, he had the Beacon storage, he had the storeroom at Beacons, which contained, when it was left to me after he died, um, the Laurel and Hardy scripts that he shot, the, the cans of film, the color film of World War II. Yeah. Uh, the things he picked up during the war, all of his records. And my, my mother kept things and she kept the, 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 his grandparents, his parents' papers and diaries and photographs, which was just this two big boxes, which helped me because we didn't discuss family a lot. And my hmm. you know, dad was away at war for three years. And, you know, I never really probed deeply about his parents and his, my great grandmother was named Georgia Woodthorpe. She was born in San Francisco just after the Civil War. And around age eight, she was at an actor's club for some reason. And a great Shakespearean actor asked her father, could she become part of their company? So my great grandmother, uh, Georgia, became an actress. And um, she became very successful. And she is the youngest Ophelia to Edwin Booth's Hamlet, the greatest Shakespearean actor. So, she, so that's where it started. And so I have these photographs. And so I had a lot to work with in that respect. And uh, I kept I kept records and notes and files and and I have a respectable memory. I should say so. I mean, it's kind of incredible. Um, it, it makes me nervous. I try to try to remember what I had for lunch yesterday and I, I can't and it, it's it's it, we're all the better for it because every <clears throat> every page I turn seems to bring a new adventure. Um, <clears throat> the sections on JFK when you first go to Washington, it's never been it, I don't think it's ever been put so clearly to me just how or the way that your impressions of him are just how moving uh, he could be and what a force he seemed to be. I love your descriptions of him. Um, if you could talk about that, because it was the first time I, I've, I've always heard him idolized, but never quite put exactly the way that you you put it seemed to crystallize it for me um, of how alternately uh, inspiring and, 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 and moving he, he seemed to be. Um, yeah, indeed. If, if, if I just to perhaps to give some context. Yes, mm -hmm. please. Of how, of how I got from Hollywood, where I had I was I worked with my father on uh, a little bit on a place in the sun. <clears throat> I was on location in Shane and quite involved in Giant, though I managed to serve two years in the Air Force while he was making Giant, and mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the Diary of Anne Frank. And I'd also gotten started as a director, first working for Jack Webb, and then. Alfred Hitchcock presents. Alfred Hitchcock presents, right? Yeah. In fact, I became a member of the Guild in 1957, um, which which speaks to my antiquity. <laughs> um, and but and so I kind of used to joke that you know I I had decided that I was going to spend my it seemed like I was going to spend my entire career working to become the second best film director in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and then Edward R. Murrow came into my life uh, unexpectedly after Kennedy was elected. Mm -hmm. Kennedy had asked Ed Murrow to run the United States Information Agency. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Murrow was kind of an, uh, an idol of mine. You know, he'd taken on Senator McCarthy and, you know, listened to his broadcasts from London during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, anyway, that's how I got to, to Washington. Uh, right there, sorry, you also had a, 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 a very difficult cross of decision to make, didn't you, in terms of what your father was doing at that time and, and a decision that you had to make? I did, because uh, having done the Diary of Anne Frank with my father, where I was the associate producer and I directed all the location work in Amsterdam, I had really become like his partner. Right. And we were starting The Greatest Story Ever Told. 
And I had this meeting with a group with Murrow. And then I had a call, would I come and meet him on, what, meet him on Sunday? And, uh, and I asked what it was, I said, certainly. And what was it about? And he said, well, he's looking for somebody to run the motion picture division of USIA. And uh, it was Sam Goldwyn Jr. who called me. And I said, Sam, I said, you know, I'm my father's partner now. And I really wouldn't want to waste Mr. Murrow's time. Mm -hmm. Sam said he understood and he went away. 20 minutes later, he calls back and he says, Ed says, you won't be wasting his time. <laughs> so I went over to <laughs> Sam Goldwyn. I think that makes it clear, right? <laughs> I went over to Sam Goldwyn Sr.'s house and the croquet game was going on outside. <laughs> And I'm in this sort of dark Spanish living room talking to my idol, Edward R. Murrow. And mm. he offered me the job. And I said the same thing, uh, that I just really couldn't leave my father. And a few days later, I, we were at Fox at the time and was walking to lunch with Ed. And uh, it came up, but we hadn't discussed it. And, uh, and, and I told him, and he stopped walking and he looked at me and he said, uh, I think you may have to do it. You know, and it was a father seeing a path for his son, you know, perhaps out of, though I never considered being in his shadow, but it, it, it really provided a whole different life than I would have led otherwise. Um, and, and of Kennedy and to be in the government at that time, the new frontier, so many young people uh, and older experienced people. And Kennedy was just, uh, inspiring. I mean, he was had such great humor. Uh, he was idealistic, realistic, all these qualities. And, and, and he took an interest in the films we were making at USIA, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, was kind of great for me. Uh, so it was a, and, you know, he was eloquent in so many ways. And he said, uh, in a speech, at Amherst College in honor of Robert Frost. He said, I, looked, I look forward to an America that will not be afraid of grace and beauty, that will honor achievement in the arts, the way we honor achievement in business or statecraft. Um, that was that quote on the wall of the John F. Kennedy Center, which is the president's memorial in Washington. Mm -hmm. yes. I quoted that line to the head of the Kennedy Center when I, proposed the Kennedy Center Honors. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the whole idea, you know, that was really President Kennedy's idea, not mine. It's amazing. Seems It seems, um, I'd like a president to say that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and not to mention, that's what I would want my father to say as well, as sort of dad knows just how to, to, to give the slightest nudge, you know, to his son, to head his own direction, amazing. He, he was letting it be my own idea. He didn't say, "God, I don't want to do this, son." You know, he said, "I, I think you may, may, may have to do this." Yeah. And as I write in the book, um, he was also teaching me how to be a father. Exactly right. Uh, amazing. You know, I think just one idea that I think kind of frames some of what we're talking about um, is. In 1951 or 52, was 1951 Academy Awards. <clears throat> I went with my father. Mm. He was back from the war for some years. Um, and I sat next to him. And uh, 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 Joe Bankowitz, a great figure in our guild, uh, came on the stage to announce he was the winner from the previous year, I think, for All About Eve. Okay. Yeah. He wrote the nominees for Best Director the African queen, John Houston, Vincent Minnelli, an American in Paris, William Wyler, detective story, Elia Kazan, a streetcar named Desire, mm -hmm. and George Stevens, a place mm -hmm. in the sun. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I've never heard of any of these guys. <laughs> yeah. right. Amazing, what a list, what a list. Then I would not be telling this story, nor would my book be called My Place in the Sun, were it not for the fact that Mankiewicz read his name. Yeah. And he went, but he, he, he was driving the car, he, driving the car home. 
I love that. My yeah. mother, grandmother, his actress mother, and, mm -hmm. and my mother in the back seat. And the Oscar was on the seat between us. And I was, I mean, 18, I guess. And, uh, I, I, and I never had forgotten that he looked over at me and he said, you know, he said, we'll have a better idea what kind of a film this is in about 25 years. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was speaking about the test of time. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. And, you know, he'd, he'd been raised around the theater and, and he had that feeling, which was, this is before video, before cinema text. Uh, you know, he had this sense of the test of time. Now, he did not know that the person he was saying that to was one, one day going to become the founder of the American Film Institute. Right which is all about the test of time. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's an idea in this book that I think is, you know, important to what we do because, you know, certainly has been my mantra and connects to what we were just talking about with President Kennedy, uh, the test of time. And, uh, you know, I just think it's an important idea for those of us who love film, want to preserve film, want to see motion pictures be everything they can be because we're all connected to the pictures that really last and hold up. It's amazing. It's, it, I think if, it seems to me that if you remember that and you keep that, that impulse close to you, it helps you weather uh, moments that where everything seems to go belly up. It seems like for, there's many times in your book where there seems to be incredible optimism in the beginning of the, They'd be um, starting to work with JFK, which is then sort of what feels instantly snatched away from you and sort of moving into something else or Edgar R. Murrow snatched away from you suddenly uh, after all this optimism. And it seems time and time again, that, or AFI launching so wonderfully for a few years and then suddenly it's on the rocks. You know, it seems that, um, that to, to hold in your head that it's, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint is something that can help you get get through these kinds of moments, I would imagine. Isn't it? Yeah, and, and certainly how particularly it, it applies to filmmaking, that uh, how many things have we been involved in that we said, if only I could get out of this, <laughs> you know, but you have no choice. You have to weather the storm and, <laughs> and, and outsmart the studio head and, you know, to find a way to make the picture you want to make. Yeah, it, it, when you're before you're on the set, it's sort of like it, it can feel day to day or week to week that you're dodging bullets. And then you you yeah. get to what you think is the freedom of the set and you realize you're dodging, dodging bullets every 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 moment, you know, that there's a new decision and a new problem to kind of come up with <laughs> to, right. to, to, to manage, I suppose. And, and, and the guild has been very important in that in the effort of, to get more control in the hands of directors. You're, that that seemed to be instilled in you by your father as well. You sort of hear of those contract negotiations and his willingness to sacrifice everything uh, for the most important thing, which was a creative creative freedom and independence. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah. Well, thank goodness that he was there at the beginning of this of, of this guild. He he was the, he was that he. He was the president for two, uh, two, how long? I can't, I can't. So he was president uh, when, in his thirties um, before he went to war. And That's then right. I think he was twice president again after he came back. That he, he was a lifelong member of the board, it seemed. He cared a great deal about the guild. Amazing. So where were we? Let's, let's, let's give, if we're kind of taking a, V vaguely chronological um, approach. I love it when you get to Washington. That seems to be I, the, the early chapters of the book. You sort of have all these Hollywood players, you know, which which don't seem so foreign to me, only because I live here and I have read so much about it. But I love getting to Washington because that's that's more of a foreign country to me, you know. Um, but it seemed that you were able to step into it relatively easily or, or, or was the transition uh, more challenging than, than you'd expected? You know, it wasn't. Um, it's so interesting. I was 29 when I arrived at 1776 Pennsylvania Avenue 
at the United States Information Agency with the sign out in the front saying, telling America's story to the world. Mm -hmm. And Murrow had asked me, that I would make 300 documentaries a year, I, I would oversee um, to help the world understand the United States and its policies. And, mm -hmm. and Murrow had raised, everybody was playing at the top of their game at USIA, he was an inspiring leader. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, again, I was making films kind of like it within a big studio, uh, or I had a little studio that would had to yeah. answer to these regional directors and people who had an interest in the films we were making. And it just became so similar to right. what, what, what went on at studios. I mean, how was I going to get control of the work? And I brought in a lot of young, really talented filmmakers. And, you know, I had to kind of defend these films with them uh, in front of the regional directors. Otherwise, you'd take suggestions from the five different <laughs> regions and you'd have uh, buttermilk. You know? Yeah. Uh, and it, and it, and it, I was just really felt quite comfortable with it. Mm. Um, I, I, I loved a story I remembered about Frank Capra when he was, uh, you know, Colonel Capra during the war. And he came to Washington to the Pentagon, uh, which is a new building then, and for a meeting. He walked in and there were 12 generals and they all had their fruit salad, all their medals on. And yeah, and they were all very happy to see him. And Capra is about five foot six. And he went around shaking hands with all of these generals. Oh, Mr. Capra, so glad you're here and all. And there was this long, big conference table there, all set up with water glasses and pens and pencils and all. And, and they kind of went quiet for a minute. And Capra says, well, fellas, so he said, are we here to talk about movies? And they all nodded. He says, then I sit at the head of the table. I underlined that and put an exclamation mark next to it. I read your book. I thought that is fantastic. You know, by the way, fruit salad is a terrific phrase. That's the sort of uh, that's sort of what they call all that stuff, all the pins and everything on there. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. That first, sorry, because I just that the first real success you had in that the biggest success was was the film that you made about uh, the first lady going to India. Right. Is that fair to say? It was the first film I made. Well, yes. that was the first one, and yeah. the, and the and the and so you guys so you, out of the gate, you did good. Yes, yes, and uh, you know, within within four months of being there, I was at a, a screening in the White House with the president and Jackie and Ed Murrow um, and some, some, you know some others, ambassador from India showing the, the first film I'd made to the president and first lady. So it was very heady stuff, you know, that Murrow gave me a lot of headroom and backed me up. And uh, so, you know, and it, we were making quite an impression. Is there, is, am I, is it, is it, there's a, I, I, I wish I don't, I hope I don't butcher it, but you'll have to help me out a little bit. There's a, there's a quick passage where you know, that it was Robert Kennedy's understanding of the power of these short films and the potential that could happen. And you really give him credit, say that it was his mind that saw what the possibilities here were, good, good and bad, I think. Yeah. Yes, no, and, and but it happened when <clears throat> after his brother's death, and he resigned as attorney general after a year <clears throat> and ran for senator of uh, mm -hmm. New York. And he called me and said, I think a biographical film is going to be important. Uh, and I said, what should it say? And he told me, you know, that he, you know, he had a, kind of had a light touch, a wry sense of humor. He says, one, if it, <clears throat> if it can convince people I'm not a carpetbagger. He hadn't lived in New York since he was 14. Uh, and then I'm not ruthless, <laughs> which you know was the rap on Bobby that he was ruthless. And we made a half hour documentary, Charles Guggenheim, was a very fine documentary filmmaker. And Bobby really felt it made the difference in, in him getting elected senator. 
because he was running against a very strong Republican opponent, um, <clears throat> the incumbent. Yeah, so, uh, and, and then I had a, just another experience that Michael Beschloss, the historian, wonderful historian, called me or sent me an email. This is 50 years after I had been in the government and said, did you hear about the tapes on in the Oval Office? I didn't know what he was talking about. And he sent me a link and I was, came home one that night, that evening, and put on a headset and went to this link. And it's President Kennedy's voice 50 years after uh, in the Oval Office, eight weeks before he was killed with his brother, Bobby, and Steve Smith, his brother-in-law, and a guy named John Bailey, who was head of the Democratic National Committee. And he's talking about the 1964 convention where he expected to be running in a year. And he is saying, have you seen these films that George Stevens is making at USIA? You know, I think we should not have a boring keynote speech. We should start with a film. And, uh, you know, and they said, Bobby, will you find out, find a way we can get George to make these films, you know? And to hear that, you know, I had no idea that President, I was anywhere in his scheme of things, uh, but, they got it. They knew the power of film. They were two of the smartest political people of a generation. There's an interesting moment. I can't. Re I cannot recall what film was having a Gala Washington D.C. presentation, but you mentioned it was your only sighting of Lyndon Johnson, where yeah. he's sort of on the outskirts and feeling. What, what what film was it? I can't remember what what screw. Uh, it was Audrey Hepburn. Yes. Maybe it was Breakfast at Tiffany. I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, and it was the Kennedy crowd, all these young people. And here's this guy in this big suit and the pants are too big. And, you know, um, and he's kind of off to the side. He's the vice president of the United States. But, you know, it was a really, in retrospect, a lesson in um, how things can change. Uh, and taking it a step further, once Lyndon Johnson becomes president, isn't aren't there tapes where he's he's a, a little bit suspicious of 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 your films or the or the the direction that they're heading? Do I have that right? Um, there's some. Yeah, there's. He was. I wore a PT one hundred nine tie clasp. Everybody did at New Frontier. <laughs> I was invited actually by Jack Valenti, who was his aide at the time to come along to dinner at the one that, in the family quarters of the restaurant of the White House. And I just remember Lyndon Johnson's sitting and he had a bowl of peas and he'd pick them up and he'd eat the peas so he could keep an eye on whoever he's talking to. And, and I felt this tie clasp glistening that it was, it, his eye was going down to my tie clasp and further identifying me as a Kennedy person. But, uh, but I did. I worked with, with with Johnson, and we did some good things during that period. It's amazing that section of the book as you as you navigate all these changes. It's kind of um, yeah, makes Hollywood seem downright tame at a certain point. Just how kind of rocky it seems to get through there with the changing administrations and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Someone um, was asking the other day about this question you asked earlier about the transition of me going to Washington <clears throat> and how do you relate? And, and I had mentioned that my father dealing with Harry Cohn at uh, Columbia, he, Harry Cohn wanted him to come over and Harry Cohn agreed, I'll never come in your set and you have final cut, you know? And <laughs> in the conversation about, and I said, well, dealing with Harry Cohn, I don't think is all that different than dealing with Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, is the house you're in now the house that's that's referenced in the the book that you bought? Are if you're in Washington D.C., is that the I, same I, home? I still live in the house. I happen to be in Maine. I uh, see. It's a summer little place up here um, that I still live uh, on Avon Lane in Washington. Unbelievable. That's a wonderful. Um, section of the book um buying that house from that man for the mantelpiece you know the, 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 exactly 
where should we go next? I have so I I could <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but I could really do this all day. So I don't. Well, want... I, 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 the one thing that may be interesting, you ask about Kennedy and yes, um, the borough, that that whole thing, <clears throat> and it's day after the assassination. You, you cannot you can't imagine <clears throat> how uprooted we felt. You know, a beautiful fall day, and everything you believe in has just been kind of snatched away, and and I. It happened that my father had not been to Washington since I had gone a couple of years earlier. And there was a meeting of the Directors Guild scheduled for November 23rd and in Washington. That's and right. he'd gotten to the airport and heard the news and he decided to come ahead. And so we had breakfast that morning and I started to think about, you know, what I should do. And I went into the office, Murrow, had been out having a lung removed mm -hmm. um, and and it was a Saturday and I, I asked to see him and I went up to his office and he didn't have the Savile Row suit on. He had a cardigan sweater and he had never sat behind his desk. I see these pictures of Trump with everybody. Yeah. Ed always came over and sat on the sofa opposite you. And he sat down and he handed me a letter and across the table and I took it and read it. And it was at the White House and it said, Dear Ed, and it was a letter from John Kennedy dated 10 days earlier saying, Dear Ed, I'm glad you're gonna be back. We really missed you, we need you. I saw the five cities of June the other night. I think it's the best government documentary I've seen. This is a film that we had made. And it, it, the little, and signed Jack. And I'm here holding this letter that was in his hands. Mm. Ten just days ago, it just says, yeah. you know, and it took took my breath away, you know. And I passed the letter back to Ed, and he put his hand up and he said, "You made the film. You keep the letter." Mm. And of course, I have the letter, mm. and it tells you a little bit about Ed Murrow. Yeah. But then I had this idea, and I told him my idea. I said. I think we should make the first feature length film that AFI, that USIA has ever made. Uh, and it's gonna cost $250,000, which was 10 million six in that. In yeah. That. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, but we can, I have cameramen, 35 millimeter film in seven mm -hmm. foreign capitals with the film event reaction, film the four days of the funeral in color. And then we, mm -hmm amongst the days of the funeral and the reaction, the story of the new frontier. And Ed listened, didn't say anything. He said, uh, first he said, make a 10 minute film about Lyndon Johnson. And for those of us who were in the business of pitching films, <laughs> that was a memorable experience where <laughs> I realized that there was a certain advantage of wisdom and experience. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to youthful brilliance. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we made a 10-minute ten, ten film about Lyndon Johnson and photographed him in the Oval Office lit at night. You know, when, and Gregory Peck, the narrator, and, and you see a window in the White House and the, the, the light in the White House window did not go out, you know. And you come in, there's Lyndon Johnson. So Murrow knew what our job was. And he also knew that making a film about President Kennedy would fall more easily on Lyndon Johnson. And, and Johnson fell in love with this film called The President. So anyway, it was uh, very useful advice. That is wise words from Mr. Murrow, brilliant. I do love that passage when don't, I think you, you, I don't remember if you turn up at Lyndon Johnson's ranch to discuss it with him, but wherever it happens to be, he seems to have come from a, from a, a, a having a few uh, a, having a good time for himself, right? He, he, he thinks oh, no, it was when we were shooting that he. Oh, it was when yes, <laughs> it's when you're he'd been swimming in the White House pool and had a couple of a couple of <laughs> shots, you know, with, with Pierre Salinger. That's right. <laughs> That's the wonderful passage about the uh, lamp on the table, right? There's the- Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. 
you know, it does seem it does seem so skillfully navigated this sort of one, two, three punch um, that the country took one, two, three, four, really, if you include Murrow for you, but um, between Kennedy and then Dr. King, and then immediately on the heels, uh, Robert Kennedy going down, that, that the way that you've written it out and lined it up really um, cons consolidates and brings home the, and, and, and helps explain just how uh, off course those three events through this country and it's just amazing to read it in the book i don't I mean, just to, to sort of compliment you on how um well it's written through there and sort of devastating to look back and think well no wonder no wonder we lost our way um yeah. for a moment seems... I, I, I would just in, in, in having reflected on it <clears throat> that as catastrophic as the john kennedy assassination was i think bobby's uh, assassination was more consequential because I think he could have pulled the country together. I, I do believe he would have gotten the nomination. He could speak to the young people. Yeah, they, he could speak to the, the African American population uh, and and the working class. And uh, so it, it really unmoored us. Yeah, that that it's it's driven home quite strongly. Um, in in the book um <clears throat> let's talk about the afi right which um the it, it's it's an incredible achievement and a kind of hilarious uh like roster like a murderer's row of what's emerged from it you know when you think about kind of premier film artists i mean not just the obvious ones like david lynch and terrence malick but you know, I work now with a gaffer and director of photography, Michael Bauman, you know, um, right. yeah. I mean, the list is, um, it, the list is, 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 it's a mile long of what's emerged out of that. But um, <clears throat> I love hearing about how, how, how well it all goes for those first few years. You know, it's, um, <laughs> it seems yeah. to be too good to be true. You get lucky, you luck into the Greystone mansion and everything's going so well. <laughs> it's always great when you read passages like that, you think this can't last, it can't last. Yeah. But, um, but it's remarkable those early days, if you could just talk about that formation and the kind of trigger for that. And, um, and that really ends up making you that really draws you back between two places. That makes you, uh, you know, spread out between two two points, doesn't it? Yeah, they didn't. When President Kennedy <clears throat> appointed the first National Arts Council um, with Isaac Stern, Marian Anderson, Agnes DeMille, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Yamasaki, uh, my father, Gregory Peck. Um, you know, which it's never been like that since, you know, it was artists who ran yeah. the National Arts Council um, and, the, and later the National Endowment. And when the National Endowment was started, they knew what to do about opera and ballet. <clears throat> they didn't know what to do about film. You can't give a grant to Warner Brothers, somebody said, you know. Yeah. And I was in that kind of perch at USIA where I was kind of you know, in, involved in, in the government um, and, you know, it, it was it become somewhat known to many people. And I, I was asked and I suggested an American Film Institute you know, with the principal thing of preserving the classic films, trying to elevate film in the eyes of the uh, public and the, it was about be about the art of film mm -hmm. and, uh, to train filmmakers. And so it was uh, and I think it worth noting in this context that it, we have really produced wonderful people at the AFI, but uh, considering who I'm talking to, I, it's probably worth pointing out that that's not the only way you become a distinguished filmmaker. No. <laughs> <laughs> there are many paths to uh, making fine films. Um, I love that the screening room, uh, the screening room uh, at Greystone was shot in the it was the bowling alley. Yes, we ended up going back and uh, we shot there will be blood in that bowling alley because I of course, yeah. you know, I had I had read so much about Doheny 
yeah, um, and stolen a lot from his life and kind of put it into the story. It's amazing um, to, to think that you set up shop there. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it was really, it was, it was bizarre <laughs> when you think about it, all these kids, as, we had to make an agreement with the neighbors. They protested the city renting this to AFI for 10 years. Um, and I and I had to admit that uh, many of, of the fellows, perhaps a majority of them, had a passing resemblance to Che Guevara <laughs> driving up into Beverly Hills and into the, the, the mansion. Yeah, yeah. Oh, incredible. So, but let's back to the DGA, um, because now you're now, we talked about your father, but now we're entering three three decades or three generations yeah. of Stevens. Stevens, um, it's, it's, we're sort of entering royalty at this point, George, I think is what you call it, Hollywood royalty, because your son won, uh, was created the, uh, the DGA short moment in time, yes? Yes, he did, Michael. Mm -hmm. And then he won, he won an Emmy for that. And he's done the DGA awards as well. Yeah. So he's got a legacy now as well. He directed two feature films and he was my partner on um, the Kennedy Center Honors at, at the later stages. And Right, and right. So, yeah. So at this point, the Guild, what does the Guild mean to you then? Your entire family is, I mean, this you're, you're linked as deeply as you can be. Um, <clears throat> what is your, what, with your, with your family's extensive Guild service, what does it mean to you? Well, it's, it, it's been part of my life, you know, uh, First to my father, mm. then you know, obviously, when I became a director, uh, the member was so valuable. <clears throat> and then I went off to Washington and ceased directing for for uh, you know, kind of twenty years. But then I could go back to it um, after that, you know. And I think the guild is just uh, it's maintained a reputation. Uh, through the years. In fact, in that, I think members will enjoy that chapter. I think I call the chapter higher education uh, because what I learned observing the, De the DeMille Stevens Mankiewicz yeah. episode, mm -hmm. uh, I really said I was learning more about the important things in that situation than I was at college. And that was, if you recall, toward the end of it, one of my father's uh, statements, where he's put at, at the famous meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel, is that he thought that the important what the guild should be concentrating on opportunities for its members, mm -hmm. not fighting communism. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's. Uh, I think there's been a tremendous through line at the guild uh, through the years. Uh, so it's a, it's a very important part of, as, as you say, my family life. Incredible. <clears throat> well, you know, I don't, I know we, I don't want to take up much more of your time, but I want to bring up something that I want, I've been, I wanted to tell you the one thing <clears throat> it's a sort of surprise that I found in the book is that I'm sitting right now in the home of Wilbur Hansen. No. I honest to goodness, I'm in Tarzana and I, I, I have two I have a house up the street and BJ, his wife, who passed a few years ago, uh, sold me to her house before she died. And this is where Curtis was raised and his brother Woody and Wilbur lived here uh, since 1951. And so when I got to that, the passages in your book where you speak of him, I was, I mean, jumping out of, out, of, out of my chair with excitement to talk to you about this because um, I never knew him, but I love um, that you talk about him and you talk about him at a time when your father is away and, and the, the challenges that there must have been to not have your dad with you and to have somebody there to, you know, at that really important time, you're a teenager, you're probably lost even if your dad is around, but to have this guy, Wilbur Hansen, speak to you is is so amazing um and yeah so i'm in his house right now that, that is just a, a, and he was of course uh, curtis hansen's father that's right yeah and, and he was my mr chips mm -hmm. you know, the, 
he uh, encouraged me in writing and and I, as I said, he was the basketball coach. Yeah. And he the, and the, there was no Bobby Knight in him. If people mm -hmm. are familiar with the named Indiana coach, who win at all costs. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so he was a, a valuable person in my life. Yeah. Well, it's incredible that we share that. I'm so happy. Um, I could talk to you all day. There's so much to talk about. And I, I don't know if we've covered everything, if there's anything else you'd want to talk about or cover. Yeah, you know, just a th 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 thought about in closing, uh, I talk about the test of time. Yeah. And people ask me, what's the most important thing, you know, about filmmaking that you learned from your father? I always go back to <clears throat> one thing, and it's respect for the audience. Uh, that in, in those days when I was around with him in the studio era, um, you know, the heads of studios were fond of saying that the audience has the mentality of 14 year olds and yeah. get lofty and, you know, if, and always they're not going to understand this and not going to understand that. And, um, and my father always used to say that he had respect for the, you have to have respect for the audience. And I particularly remember a story about when Shane was in release and he was doing an interview with, I think, a British reporter. And, uh, and, he, and I remember him saying, you know, I, I think I made this film for, for, for the truck driver in Kansas. Um, <laughs> this fellow kind of leaned in and he said, you know, he, he, he's alone a lot of the time. He's driving his truck and he has time to think and he has ideas. And he may not be able to express them, but it, so he was always thinking that way, that not mm -hmm. looking down on the audience, but uh, trusting them and leaving something for them to do. I mean, you, you know this, uh, I don't have to tell it to you, but I think it's just a worthy reminder for those of us who are out telling stories to people to hold that respect. Well, that's beautifully said. And I, yeah, I agree. It's, I, and I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Audiences like to be respected, don't they? They sort of, yeah, they deserve it. George, I hope it's, I hope I get to see you again soon. It's, oh, I, yeah. Oh, well, God, yes. Um, when, when I'm in Los Angeles, shall I give you a holler? Oh, my gosh, please. I, 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 I hope it's soon. Because honestly, we've really only scratched the surface. It's such a remarkable book. I'm, I'm, I, I enjoyed uh, reading it and have, and panicked because the feeling with any great book is when you see the last twenty or thirty pages in sight, you just want to slow down because it, it, tragically, it's going to be over soon. So I'm, I'm just near the end. I'm like, I'm, I'm sad that it's coming to an end. It's been such a, a joy reading um, it. It's really remarkable. Oh, thank you. And um, I've really enjoyed this talk and so happy that we could do this uh, for the Guild. Yeah, fantastic. All right, George, enjoy your summer. I hope I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks for everything. Take care. Thanks for listening to another DGA Q&A. If you'd like to hear more, The Director's Cut is available wherever you listen to podcasts. And please share, subscribe, rate, and review. We'd love to hear your feedback, and you can help fellow film buffs find the show. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is produced by the Directors Guild of America.